Alrighty, it's March 27th, 2019. This is our final orientation meeting, but as I mentioned earlier, of course, not a goodbye. This is just the beginning. Um, the purpose of these orientation meetings was to give you an overview of the Scribe Wellform document workflow and the process in which you can produce open textbooks in the cooperative. And we will continue to be here as a community and support you as you actually start working on projects. Um, which is usually when things will start to gel a little bit. Right now it probably feels rather abstract and perhaps overwhelming to learn all this material and not necessarily be applying it. And so I would just like to um, let you know that we will continue to be here as you work on those projects and it all starts to, to gel. So Today we're going to start uh, with a review of our homework. I'm just giving you a preview of our agenda here. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about file types, some trade-offs and attributes, and information on generating and preserving files. Uh, we recommend librarian and instructional design and other input into this process. You may already have a process for preserving files, but we're going to talk about it within the context of the Wellform document workflow. We're going to talk about converting from Word to EPUB to show you how that works. And uh, we're going to have a guest from Scribe, John, the Director of Electronic Book Development and Accessibility, who's going to talk more about accessibility standards, your role in accessibility or the author's role, and how to start working on accessibility at the start. And we're going to talk a little bit about printing and providing print copies. And I'm going to ask you uh, to take time during this meeting to give feedback about the orientation training as a whole. I prepared a short survey and just so that we um, hear from you, I would like to make some time in the, in the today to do that. Then we'll talk about archiving best, best practices, um, maintenance plans, and uh, ask you to share um, your key takeaways from from our time together. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we have two hours set aside. I don't know if it will take that long, but um, I'm going to say it again. It does. It's not the last time we will all uh, see each other and support one another. So homework um, or any questions from unit seven. When uh, we assigned it as homework, we knew that much of the material would be somewhat familiar because we had already covered it in class. Um, so hopefully as you're reading, you're like, oh yeah, okay, right, these things. Um, but I'm going to pause and see if there's anything you guys would like to discuss. Well, there's always questions. There's so much in all this. Um, so one of the things was I did try to download um, Sublime and then it took me to Sublime 3 and I wasn't sure if that was what I was supposed to do so I just kind of stopped there. But I'm trying to figure out where Sublime fits into this, like according to the, the workflow image, it's pretty late in the game that Sublime looks like it's down after you've converted in. I, 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 when do you use Sublime? First question. Sure. Okay, I can answer that one. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so we use Sublime as a tool to supplement pretty much everything that we do um, here. So if you'll notice when we talked about composition and we talked about composition QC, there were those checks at the end of the QC list um, that you know had us convert to a SAM file and then run those checks um, on that file rather than in Word. Um, and for that, you need Sublime. So Sublime is sort of, um, it's peppered in. It is more used like towards the end, especially in ebook development, but it's peppered in throughout everything. We use here at Scribe, we use Sublime Text 2. Our tools are set up for that. Um, I have actually asked um, our development team here if we're you know, processing and, and thinking about um, moving over to Sublime Text 3, but that's still up in the air and in development, right? So uh, right now, Sublime Text 2 is what we have as our um, you know, stable program and what works with uh, all our tools and what we're supposed to install. So whenever you go to Sublime, um, the website itself, I think, 
um, Sublime Text 3 is now the default. They're, they're out of beta with Sublime Text 3, and that's probably why it took you there. Uh, but they still have the option to, down, to download Sublime Text 2, which is what we use and what everything in our documentation sort of points to. Um, so yeah, so you'll want to have Sublime Text 2 um, installed on your machine and set up in the way that we've described in the module, just in case uh, you're going to be the person, you know, who becomes the composition ap expert and you'll have to be running that for uh, certain composition QCs or if you're, especially if you're going to be working on the eBooks uh, with it in-house, you'll want Sublime Text uh, 2 installed on your machine and set up as we have it on the documentation. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and if not, you know, you can tell me um, what specifics uh, you would like me to talk about. And I'll add, and I think maybe Michael will add, uh, that you know, using Sublime is optional if that seems like a, a path you'd rather not trod. Um, and if you do decide you would like to learn more about it and you get to that point, we can certainly dedicate a tea time to it or you know, put it out there to the whole group and say, hey, we're gonna spend some time on Sublime um, and support you in that way. Just, you know, we just need to, hear from you guys, so please know that's an option. So, so um, I guess the most basic way to use it would be just to double check your code that, that underlines the WYSIWYG interface? Yes. Um, so yeah. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Oh, you're muted, Mike. You're like me? Okay. He's, it, see, that's the thing. That's politeness, politeness. Um, so yeah, so Sublime, uh, yeah, we that would be the the... The basic use of it. If you're not going into like the full-on ebook development and you're just using it to check, that would be the 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 base use of it. Um, Sublime is robust enough so that you can, you know, want, if you do decide to go into ebook development. Um, and like Karen said, we didn't touch on that in the orientation. But if if you so need that, we can dedicate a tea time to talk about it, or um, you can consult with us uh, and we can work something out to do something like a specific ebook training um, at a later date. But um, yeah, you would use Sublime specifically for that. But um, other than that, the base use would be to just make sure that, you know, things are well formed, that things, um, you know, validate against the DTD and that your, um, as you said, it, your code is correct. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, I had a couple of little questions. Super. Um, so I didn't get what this reg X was. So what's this regular regular expression? Website, but mm -hmm. uh, regular expressions. Mm -hmm. So a regular expression, again, something that we weren't going to go too in depth because it, it does take some learning um, uh, to get, um, you know, to a point where you can like build your own regular expressions and things like that. But it's essentially a search string that allows you to, in a document like, for example, our SAM or our SCML file, it allows you to uh, not only search for certain things rather than say, hey, I need to search for a cat, but I can search for any three-letter word. Um, a regular expression allows you to do that. Um, and then... On top of that, it also allows you to um, sort of search and replace throughout an entire document so you don't have to do, um, you know, one by one changes. Um, so that is a little bit more advanced, right? And so um, we use, like, for example, those text checks that you see in the composition QC list, those are regular expressions. Um, and they're just search strings that allow you to uh, pinpoint issues that perhaps your eyes may miss if you're just scrolling through a document. And so, so that was one of those things you were showing us on what Sublime does. Correct, correct. And you need to, because I went into that game and it was like, mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out how to indicate that it was three letters at the end of a word. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so there's stuff to learn about how to use that properly. Correct, correct. And that's exactly why we included those links. Those links are there just to sort of give you a taste to get your, your, your feet wet, if I can mix metaphors. Um, and... Um, like allow you to start thinking in that sense uh, so that when and if you do decide to build your own regular expressions to, you know, search uh, through your files and um, catch things and whatnot, uh, you'll be able to do so. So again, that's another thing that we can sort of dedicate more time to at a later date is just that in the orientation that was delving far, far too deep into the deep end. Got it. I just needed, like, I wasn't understanding what it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, there was something about image sizes. So is, mm -hmm. is there, 
is that back in the vetting stuff on how we're supposed to format images for mm -hmm. a book? Because yeah. um, there wasn't, it said that the system, act, you know, converts it immediately mm -hmm. to 600, By 600. Uh, pixels or something like that. Yeah. So the way that, that we think of it is that in the initial vetting stage or initial review stage, however you'd like to call it, you'd want to make sure that your images are you know, high quality for print, if that's where um, the uh, open textbook is going, right? Uh, but um, when it comes to ebook, there are certain restrictions. Uh, for example, I think the cover, um, and John's in here and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, but the, uh, the cover I think can't be beyond 1800 pixels um, in um, in height, and then normal images inside the ebook are uh, can't be beyond uh, 600 pixels on their longest side. Um, so um, I think we have other options for like using full size images, but that's usually uh, the basic um, uh, the baseline. And so the hub is set up to process your images down to that 600 uh, on the longest side option, unless you choose not to do that and leave them as full size images. And I think John can talk a little bit more about that once um, um, his turn comes up. But again, we're not gonna be getting into too okay. deep into ebook. This is for the ebook. This is for correct. the ebook, correct. The version. And mm -hmm. then same thing, I had a question about the fonts. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm still hoping one of these days that I will publish my own book, which will have a lot of diacritics mm -hmm. in, you know, so, um, and I don't even know, it used to be back in the day, you download like a whole font set, but mm -hmm. nowadays you just tell your computer to, you know, speak Spanish or Latvian mm -hmm. or whatever it is, and it does. You know? right. so there's some fonts somewhere that need mm -hmm. to be downloaded in this. Uh, uh, yeah. Michael, I'm too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're typesetting, you're definitely going to need fonts that support the type of characters that you're using. Um, I can <clears throat> give you some recommendations for ones that have a very wide range. Um, and like, if you have access to the entire Adobe creative suite, um, that's a subscription service that Adobe offers that gives you access to InDesign, Photoshop and Illustrator, <clears throat> and also hundreds, possibly thousands of Adobe fonts. Um, Google also offers fonts that are free to use for both commercial and non-commercial purposes um, for Google fonts. Uh, some of them have great support for diacriticals and other uh, special characters. Some of them not so much. Um, but yes, if you're, um, if you're moving out of Word, you're going to need fonts in order to work with. Thank and you. that also goes for um, for EPUB because while most uh, readers can handle a lot of like the Unicode characters, there are some that need a font in order for them to display properly. And so you'll want to have uh, those same fonts from the typeset uh, available if you have them. But if not, there are open source uh, fonts that can handle a lot of um, the special diacritics um, and for example, Hebrew and whatnot. And it can get rather technical because sometimes a font is available in a format that you can typeset with, but not that you can use in an ebook. Mm. Um, but uh, that's becoming less and less of a problem as time goes on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the deep end. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your questions. They're really um, appreciated. Any other questions from any of the units? Okay, I'm gonna hand things over to Elvis, who's going to talk about file types and attributes. Okay. So um, when we're thinking of like why we're using the well-formed document workflow, why we're doing this training, why we're doing all of this, um, the reality is, is that what you want is you want your, um, your document, your manuscript, your book, your textbook to be in a file type that's going to be essentially future-proof, that you'll be able to use it later on, that you'll be able to, for example, edit it, revise it, add to it uh, without much work. You don't want to have something, for example, um, in Word, and then you do all this work in typesetting, but you don't have any files, um, you know, any of the mechanics files for 
uh, for the typeset. And so now you have to go ahead and retypeset a, um, a document when you want to add a chapter or make some changes or make some revisions. So when we're thinking of the well-formed document workflow, that's where we're sort of aiming. We're aiming for the future, making sure that everything that we do um, ends with an archival file or SCML uh, format file that will then allow you to say, okay, I need to add, you know, I need to add a chapter, I need to remove some images, you know, because maybe licensing, license has changed or something like that, or I need to, you know, tweak this chapter with new information and things like that. Um, and so I want to be able to recreate not only the ebook, not only the Mobi, but also, um, you know, the HTML if you were using it on a website or, um, or, um, the PDF itself um, that people were using to print. So in that case, uh, the Wellform Document Workflow, what it allows you to do, it gives you, it puts in a lot of this work up front, which we've talked a lot about uh, in the previous classes, but it does, that, it does that so that you can move from Word and then go into, into SCML for typesetting and so on and so forth, then you can make your changes. And at the end of the whole process, you'll have not only your PDF, you'll have not only your EPUB and your Mobi and all the files that you need, but you'll also have that SCML file uh, that is that archival file that you can just save and store. Um, it's future-proof because it's based on XML, so it's not like things are going to change so drastically that we can't take something from, let's say, 10 years ago and uh, create a new version of a book. And that's actually uh, things that we've done um, here, and uh, Mike and John can attest um, to that, right? And so uh, you don't want to just save things in, like, for example, PDF uh, and say, well, this is my final file because PDF, extracting information from it is almost impossible. Uh, you have to go through this whole OCR process process um, and likely you'll end up losing information and having to spend even more money uh, and more time on getting something back to where you um, wanted it to be. So you don't want PDF to be your final format. You don't want ebook to be your final format either because it's the same thing, even though you have the code there and whatnot, transforming that back into, for example, Word file is incredibly uh, difficult. So uh, what we want to do and like what we're teaching you guys to do and what we're offering you with our services is this ability to create these files that are now uh, going to be permanent and that you will essentially be future proofed as I've already mentioned. So you'll know that years down the line, let's say, um, I know that for example, in OER, um, there are constant revisions. You can give your author um, the option and say, hey, look, once a year, uh, you can go back and review your files and, you know, we can make changes and you can do that at a much lower cost and a much lower time investment than you would if you would have to, for example, go from the PDF and start all over again and transform that back to Word and deal with like breaks that are now not correct and things like that. Um, so yeah, so when we think about um, SCML and when we think about everything we're doing, it does seem, as I've said before, like a lot of work that we're doing now, but you do that work in order so that your files are in the best shape possible uh, for now and for the future. So at the end, as I mentioned before, um, of the Wellform document workflow, after you've gone through it, you'll end up with the files that you need, but you'll also end up uh, with the files that are required for you to deal with things um, in the future, right? So um, there are many, different ways, like for example, you can use the SCML file to go back into Word and make edits and make changes, and then we can proceed from there into, um, you know, typesetting, and because we already have, for example, the mechanics files or anything like that, we can just make some uh, changes to uh, design as needed and things like that, and it's all, um, how can I say it, it's all less time intensive than it would have been um, had you said, well, now I only have this PDF and this is the only thing that we have. And so we have to go from here. Um, um, on top of that, you're also able to, for example, regenerate uh, an EPUB with changes. You're able to regenerate a Mobi file with changes. Later on, I'll be doing a brief demo of going straight from Word um, to EPUB. It's not something that we recommend because there are some checks that we should do. This is just sort of a proof of concept to give you an idea of how the hub works um, along with the well form document workflow. So essentially the point of my little section here now is to tell you that when you are producing these and you're producing this with the, with a cooperative and uh, producing these books with the cooperative um, and using us or even not using us, but as long as you have that final um, like archivable format file, um, you'll be able to do something 
um, greater with your books than if you just say, well, I made a PDF and that's all I have. Um, because that um, is, and we've, we've run into that. We've run into um, clients who have told us like, this is the only file that we have. We don't have any of the mechanics files. We don't have anything else. All we have is uh, the PDF. And we're more than happy to work with that, but it, it does require a lot more work than just saying, hey, you know, we work with SCML. Here's the SCML file. We want a reprint of this book. Here are the changes we want to make. Um, that is actually quite an easier process um, than going from, for example, PDF or ebook, which are sort of dead end formats, um, as David likes to call it. Um, and yeah, I think that, that that covers that area. I don't know if anybody has any questions about that and sort of like future things that you can do with the files that you will get if you work with us or if you can go ahead and use uh, the digital hub as part of the cooperative um, and whatnot. Uh, I just wanted to add on to what else said that uh, about PDF as a archival format. Um, if you print a book or you have a book that was printed in the past, yes, you have an archival format of that book, um, but it takes a lot of work in order to get that into uh, something that can be changed or remixed or edited. Uh, and PDF is a little bit better than having a physical book sitting on your shelf for that purpose, but not all that much. So um, just a little, another way to, to think about it, that uh, PDF and book are both kind of, they're not as easily um, reused. So that's all I wanted to add on. Thanks, Michael. Uh, does anybody have any questions or concerns or worries, dreams? Okay. So Karen, should I just go right into the, the demo? Okay, we'll do. So let me just share my screen here with you. Let me just prepare this. And again, this is just a proof of um, concept. Can you see the screen? We're in the digital hub. Um, Okay, this is just a proof of concept. There is a lot more to this than just saying, hey, I have a Word file, let me put it in here, it's composed and I can make an EPUB. Um, but this is a good way to sort of test out the hub and to see um, what it can do. So as you can see here, we have our, uh, our project, um, our OTN project. I've gone in and put in all the information um, that I have available. Uh, of course, it's dummy information, uh, but when you're working in a real project, you want to fill out as much of the metadata information here under project information as possible because this um, all gets added as part of the metadata for your, uh, for your ebook. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go into files, I'm going to go to upload, and I'm going to go ahead and upload the uh, homework assignment that we composed uh, a little while back, right? And so I have that available here. So I'm just going to click and drag it into the digital hub and you'll see that is there. And I'm also going to add this cover file that I created. So if, for example, you, um, as you're composing, you have your designers or, or an illustrator create a cover file for you um, already, you can actually upload that um, directly uh, to the hub and designate it as a cover so that when you um, process the, the file to EPUB, the EPUB will have, the cover embedded in it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Drag that in there. Okay, and here you'll see, this is what we were talking about earlier uh, uh, with Myra where it's, you know, the hub will tell you like, oh, I'm going to process um, all the images down to this max width and max height. The default is 600 by 600, and it will also convert certain file types um, to JPEG, which is the, um, the pretty much the standard uh, for EPUBs, but we don't want it to process that, um, the cover. So if you click set cover here, the hub will know that that is now the cover and it will not, um, will not touch it, but just to be safe, I'm just gonna not have it process the images uh, either, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and upload those files. And you will see that the cover is here, it gives you the dimensions, all the information here, and our Word file with our green dot, as we've already discussed, um, right here um, in this view of the hub. So I'm gonna go over here and select the output type as EPUB version three. Um, EPUB version three is now 
um, the standard, uh, but we still do, uh, the hub still has the ability to produce EPUB version two um, if you need that version for um, any specific reason. So I'm gonna go in here and go to edit settings. Um, and there are default settings set up. I was playing around with this earlier, so I already had selected rebuild table of contents, which is not enabled by uh, default. Um, and I went through and I checked all the settings um, that I wanted for converting this EPUB or converting this Word file to EPUB. Um, again, um, if you click on the little I next to each of these, it'll explain what each setting does. And this information is also available on our documentation. So all our settings are now nice and set up. So I'll go down here and click save. And then I'll go up here and click convert. Now I'll repeat it again, uh, just in case, but um, this is just proof of concept. You wouldn't want to go right from a Word file to EPUB. You do want to go through all the checks, all the QC um, um, procedures, just in case um, um, you can catch things in that process. This is sort of just to give you an example of what the hub uh, can do. Elvis, while we're waiting for the conversion, um, can you remind us, did uh, Karen at Portland State, have you guys make an EPUB? Was there an EPUB part of her project? Yes, yes, there was. Um, so Karen at Portland State just handed that um, over to us. Um, so we did all the, like, all the actual work on that, so they wouldn't go into the hub and do that part. Um, but if, um, for example, you're working with us and you're like, okay, great, everything's wonderful, you can do the typeset, you can do the design, because we don't you know, have the, the person power to do that, um, but we want to do the ebook because we feel like we can do that. Um, you'll have the hub um, and our help to sort of um, guide you through that if you so need it. Um, so um, if you, it's, it's really um, up to you and up to your project and your budget um, to use either our services to produce the ebooks. Um, and when we produce the ebooks, we also use the hub here, but we go through some checks um, and you'll have the, the, the peace of mind that you'll have um, not only an expert person working on the ebook, but also an expert person checking the ebook. Uh, John will attest to that um, as he is often um, the person who you know checks and catches things um, when uh, we work here in house. So, um, so yeah, so Karen um, did have us just produce the ebook and we went straight from the InDesign XML um, to um, SML to check it. And then after that, we went right into uh, the EPUB um, and also the Mobi production. So the hub will actually generate uh, both an EPUB file and a Mobi file. Um, and over here, you'll see some alerts. It'll give you uh, certain things, like for example, the following metadata was not present. So it's, it's adding placeholder information. Um, here, it'll say like, hey, you know, you didn't have a table of content, so we generated one for you. That was one of those options that we set up under edit settings. So I'll go ahead and download this EPUB. And we use digital editions to check on, um, on PC. And this is an older version. And the reason we use this older version is just to catch uh, certain things for um, older um, ebook readers, right? So we'll just go ahead, go down here to this downloads, take this EPUB, load it in. And so you see here you have our, um, our cover, right? It was just, just that dummy cover uh, that was created. If you had obviously something more illustrated, you'd be able to see it. Um, you have the navigation here on, on the left, and that was also created um, by the hub. And you'll have this internal linking so that it goes, so you can easily um, navigate through the book, right? Benefits of a support group and so on and so forth. And the navigation is also available here. And now you can also open up this EPUB, just unzip it using a tool like 7-Zip, um, and you can actually make changes directly to the XHTML uh, files that are in there. But again, that's something going way into the deep end, so uh, we're not going to do that here. But we'll just go ahead and quickly scroll through, and you can tell um, that, there, um, that this looks a little bit different. There was supposed to be a figure here. We didn't have the image, so we didn't up, um, upload it, but it did um, use the CSS that is available on the hub and there's a default one just in case you do not have one. Although if you do have a CSS, a cascading style sheet to determine how you want your ebook to look, you are more than welcome to upload that as we uploaded the images and the Word file. 
And so you can scroll through and you can see that the tables are set up already here. You have lists set up with certain indentation and all that is determined uh, by the CSS, the cascading style sheet. We have some poetry over here, as you can tell, uh, this would be SLF, so you have a little space above, and SLL, so you have space below. And there's some poetry again. And then you have our exercise, which you can style in a box or anything like that using the cascading style sheet. And again, that's something a, a bit more uh, advanced, but there are plenty of resources online. And again, if you do want to know more information about cascading style sheets or anything like that, we can set up some things to talk a bit, a bit about that. And so yeah, there you we went straight from a composed Word file to an EPUB, uh, and you can see that the EPUB is perfectly serviceable. Um, although if you want to do a little bit more and make it a little bit more uh, exciting, right? Um, you can definitely uh, play around with the CSS um, and get that look that you want, uh, or make it even match the PDF within reason. Um, and there are other options um, which we'll talk more uh, more about if you so need to, but. Yeah, that is just a brief demo, and I'll throw it back to Karen, unless there are any questions about anything that we just did. Um, yeah, I, was, uh, sorry. Uh, I was wondering what happened to the image? Yeah, I think um, what happened was, is like I didn't upload the image. I don't actually have it available. That one was just part of the demo. Oh, okay. So okay. if, um, but if you would have that available, it would be uh, placed right there, and you would, it's often set, I think, default to center. Um, right there and it, it breaks the, the paragraph as we saw that figure caption. Uh, okay, uh, so, so after you have uploaded the, um, the cover JPEG, mm -hmm. you turned it off so it didn't go in to the... So, oh, oh I, can, uh, I see what you mean. So let me just open this quickly and share that with you. So the cover image that I created was just this little guy over here. Let me just share this quickly. So if you click on cover, this is actually an image. It's just, I wrote the text out because we don't actually have oh. to this. So, <laughs> That's the image, okay. Yeah, so that is the image. And you can actually see it as a thumbnail over here. Uh, okay. It looks kind of wonky, but there it is. All right, also, thanks. I stop doing that with the mouse, it's disorienting. But I will now, there was somebody else with a question, I think, Greg? Yeah. Well, um, actually, I, I wanted to jump in. Uh, Elvis, one of the reasons that image didn't carry over is there's an option to retain MS Word images Mm -hmm. when you convert from a word file to another format and you had that unchecked yeah uh, that one although on in that word file i think we nuked the image i think there was an actual oh, okay. image in that one yeah. okay but what mike said is true if you want to retain the word images as you're converting um you make sure you have that option clicked um and it will retain that word image yeah i was gonna i was gonna ask about um all the elements that usually go into the textbook. I'd be curious to see um, the one from Portland State that we had as the example earlier. Mm -hmm. All the layout and everything in the PDF looks great, but mm -hmm. how does that really look in an EPUB or MOBI version? Mm -hmm. um, uh, does, that, does that make sense? Like, How do all yeah. those elements actually render? In yeah, actually, yeah. Elvis, if, if you're able to bring that up, I think it would be great to look at because, Greg, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That was one of the sticking points uh, with Karen as the project manager and the faculty author who expected the EPUB to be, I think, more of a mirror image mm -hmm. of the PDF experience and so was disappointed with how the EPUB was rendering. And so um, Karen came back and, and worked with Elvis on... Um, on, on doing some changes, which Elvis can speak better to, but I do think that that's a good thing to um, potentially, I don't know, prepare your authors for or talk to them about in terms of like, you know, here's what different formats can do. EPUB is not going to be as um, designed, if you will. Heavy, yeah. And I think, right. uh, okay. Yeah, you, yeah, if you have to explain that to your authors, uh, a useful uh, way to look at it is when we're typesetting, we're designing the file and we know it's going to fit um, a physical book page that's six inches by nine inches. And we know ex we have control over exactly what format that's going to end up in. Uh, an EPUB uh, needs to be able to be read on your phone, on your seven inch tablet, on your 10 inch tablet, on different other people's sorts of phones. Uh, potentially um, being read by um, um, 
you know, non, for, for, for people who have uh, visual disabilities, uh, it will have to be read out loud. So it, it has to be able to uh, be processed in a lot of different ways. And thus, uh, it can't be as visually optimized as a typeset can because it needs to be more flexible. It needs to sort of be the least common denominator because it needs to go to all sorts of places, whereas the typeset only needs to go to one place. So for example, um, the uh, inferring and explaining, which is the project uh, from Karen Bjork, which um, Emily has so kindly linked to the site there. So if you want to download that, you're able to, um, to do that. Um, that book in typeset was two columns. Um, you can't have that in any book. So um, any book, it needed to be just you know, single column uh, text, right? And you could, for example, use what we call a fixed layout uh, EPUB. Um, which, you know, will essentially preserve all of that, but um, that takes a little bit more working than what we're working with here. So that's an option. Again, one of those things that we can, uh, we can work with, but, you know, there is a higher cost um, associated uh, with those. So I just want to share briefly again. So here is uh, the inferring and explaining book. We have our cover, and you can see that we preserve some of the um, some of the colors here, and let me get down to an actual chapter, right? We try to at least um, like make sure that it mimicked as closely as possible uh, to the, the PDF within reason, of course. Um, we have our linking available there, and let me get down to uh, the little sidebars. We actually colored them in green. Um, if the if the ebook reader uh, can't display color for whatever reason, this would just look a little bit grayed out. Um, but that goes along with what Mike was saying that we try to make things accessible to all ebook readers um, rather than just say like, well, you know, we're gonna you know, make this for the iPad, but you know, somebody may not have an iPad and they might have an Android device and now, uh, you know, their, their ebook experience isn't as great. So we try to maintain as close as possible. See, we have the, uh, the exercises and the quizzes set up uh, by this little border. So we try to keep some of the design elements, but uh, we can't keep them all. We can't keep all of the design um, because of what um, Mike has already explained. So that would be something good to explain as, as Karen already mentioned to your authors beforehand and say, hey, you know, the ebook that we're going to develop, it's gonna look nice, but it's not going to look exactly like the, um, like the PDF. Um, and if you do want it to do that, you lose the ability of, for example, of having reflowable text. Um, and that can create a whole bunch of other issues. So it's often better, especially since we're trying to be open and accessible for, for everyone, it's better to go with this this view and or this option and then you know let the authors know like it's going to look good but it's not going to be uh, a mirror image of the pdf good question yeah a great question and so for further um demonstration i would like to share my screen so elvis you open the book in um adobe digital editions like an older version of it okay and i'm on a mac and so it defaults to opening in ibook and so I'll just show you what it looks like, um, what the same EPUB looks like for me. Um, you know, if I want to see the table of contents, I can pop it out over here. Um, but I'm, you know, you can see some of those same style elements, um, but I'm in a two page view. And then the exercises that are at the end, you can, you know, see, see how they are similar, but they're rendered a bit differently in, in another tool. Okay, just wanted to show you guys that. So I think with that, I think we're ready for John. Um, John does not have a camera today, so he'll be a disembodied voice, um, but um, he will be sharing um, sharing some some screens and whatnot. So John is our director of electronic uh, book development, and he is also our accessibility expert. And as I mentioned before, uh, as director of electronic book development, he sort of oversees everything that we do when um, when it comes to converting into eBook Mobi. Um, and 
um, some of our other accessibility options, like we work with um, NIMAC to produce NIMAS files, and Jahan is also um, involved in that. So I'm going to hand it over to him, and um, he can further introduce himself and speak uh, to his expertise. Great. Thanks, Elvis. Can you hear me? Uh, perfect. Um, so I've been uh, <clears throat> I've been skulking around here listening for the last 15 minutes, um, but what I'm going to do is jump in with um, just kind of a basic overview of some of our accessibility standards and how our workflow um, inherently makes publications more accessible. Um, the best way to do that, I think, is just I'm going to share my screen. I just have some talking points, and I can kind of go over a few things, which will uh, tie into some of the questions that I was just listening to and some of the topics that you were already discussing. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see this? Okay, so I just have a basic, <clears throat> just some basic talking points um, to kind of give an, a general overview of, you know, my interpretation of accessibility and how, <clears throat> how that relates to our workflow. And I'm sure some of these concepts will be familiar to all of you. Um, you know, I haven't been privy to the entire conversation, but, um, you know, feel free to stop me with any questions, but, Basically, in a general sense, um, what we're trying to do, and we've hinted upon this with the fact that we're talking about, I'm sure you've, you've heard structure versus rendering, and you know, with all the composition discussions, we talked about the importance of identifying information based on what it is rather than what it looks like. Um, that all ties into some of the concept I heard um, Elvis talking about with future-proofing uh, publications. <clears throat> um, so really the goal is at, at the inception of, of the manuscript, for example, what we're trying to do is impart structure using, our, um, using SCML, which happens to be um, an XML language, where we can parse the information into various components that identify structurally what things are. Um, one of the main reasons <clears throat> Now, EPUBs, as you may have gathered, are based on HTML. One of the main reasons we're an XML workflow and not an HTML-based workflow is that we are, first of all, H XML is very um, customizable. We can develop it specifically for publishing. Um, it's, it's what's called an extensible markup language. So we can predetermine what the style names are and they can be anything that we want and we can make them, um, we can develop the XML in such a way that we can accommodate print spacing articulation and all the components that go into publishing a book, um, which H, uh, now conversely HTML, although that's what is the component of an ebook, um, it is primarily rendering based. Um, but since the world of ebooks works on HTML and not and not you know scribes markup language specifically. What we do is create this point document that has all the structural elements in it, all of the differentiation of the important elements, and then we're able to map that using our processes to HTML5 tagging. That's what the digital hub basically um, is able to map our scribe style names to the available HTML5. Um, tags that exist um, and that way we can preserve um, much of the well, preserve all of the intended structure and differentiation that is important for print but carry that through seamlessly to the EPUB um, and create uh, a single stream of <clears throat> you know an accessible publication um, that we have uh, a backup SCML file of, and we can, so EPUB is, happens to be the choice of accessibility at the moment, um, but that could change in the future. So once we impart all of this um, information into our document at the start, um, we can be prepared to develop for whatever comes next. Um, 
so I'll just scrolling down a little bit. One of the most important things about accessibility is merely this, the logical reading order of a book. Um, you know, having, having a, a, an intuitive narrative, having uh, placing an image <clears throat> in your publication, you know, directly after the point that it's referenced from in the text rather than you know, 10 pages away, things like that. Um, um, along with that is, the, and really one of the main components of our entire, you know, discussion and our workflow is really focusing on separating what something looks like from what, um, from its semantic meaning and what it may actually represent. Um, because the end game is really <clears throat> not, and this ties into the fact that we were just discussing, um, you know, what something looks like and it needs to be digestible by basically a machine needs to be able to interpret what something is in your book and it needs, and regardless of how it looks, um, you know, someone with a differing ability, it may use a device that where the entire book needs to be read aloud to them, for example. So it's really critical that all that um, any special elements in a book be identified in the manner that that can be done, where it, it's where a person <clears throat> uh, doesn't have to rely on physically looking at the presentation of a sidebar or a box or a list or a table to know what it is. Um, um, so with that, I mean, <clears throat> basically our whole philosophy is since we're doing all of this upstream in our, in, you know, when we compose a file, um, the goal is really to make the publication more accessible right from the start. So no matter what happens, we're, we're not repeating effort. Theoretically, um, you know, we don't just make an ebook that, um, is lacking some of this distinction and then try to reinvent it after the fact to make it later more accessible. So we like to have, um, we like to impart all of that structure and semantic um, tagging right at the get go so that we can produce a final EPUB um, that can be accessible to all. Um, some of the things like <clears throat> that are, so for example, we talked about, I heard, uh, you know, as you may have seen, our digital hub can recreate a table of contents or build one if one doesn't exist. One main, just basic component of accessibility is every publication has to have a table of contents, whether, um, I should say every ebook has to have a table of contents, whether there's one in a print book or not, for example. Um, uh, it's also a good idea to have lists of, if a book contains illustrations or tables, to have a fully articulated list of illustrations or tables that can be hyperlinked. Um, things like, uh, you know, link, links to tables and figures or inter, links to internal references to those types of elements. All of that type of extra navigation in an ebook makes it more accessible and is um, definitely very useful. Um, without, getting too much into code. I mean, I, just a few examples here of when I talk about mapping our SCML styles to an available HTML5 tag. So where for print, you know, we may have, it may make sense to us like CT is chapter title, AH is A head. Um, what happens is though, <clears throat> in the world of HTML, what we do is we've developed a system that can take our scribe naming and apply it to uh, and relate it to the appropriate HTML tag, um, which is from, from the standpoint of eBooks and, and the web is more universally interpreted. Because like I said, um, the, those things don't run on SCML, but the, the reason we use it is so we can interact with publishing programs, which is why we use an, our, an XML based workflow so that we can interact with docx and InDesign um, and not be pigeonholed into just um, using HTML to represent things, which would not work well for print. Um, so just some basic examples of, you know, we may have, we have sidebars and boxes and things like that. The equivalent available tag in HTML, which is what your sidebar or box would turn into in your ebook is something called an aside, which indicates programmatically um, 
<clears throat> and somewhat universally to e-readers and even for the, uh, for the web, that that piece of content is out of the main narrative. Um, and for, with some reading environments, um, you can actually toggle those on and off. So if you want to keep, if you don't want to read that material, you know, if it's being read aloud to you um, in some environments, my understanding is you'd be prompted to skip that information. Um, so that's an example of having semantic meaning around content where rather than if, if this was being, a, if something was being read aloud to you, it wouldn't just run through and you would have no sense of context of, of a, you know, a change in the narrative or some other um, exercise or, uh, or other material being encountered. Um, and so if we have something in our SCML labeled as a sidebar or a box, in an EPUB, it becomes this aside, but we maintain the, uh, the class will hold what was originally the scribe markup name. So we still have our own semantic meaning and as it related to how we were um, preparing it for, for instance, for print, um, but we've now mapped it to an HTML tag that has a more universal meaning um, in that world, but we're able to seamlessly go keep those distinctions and basically go from one to the other and not lose any of, by the time we get to an ebook, we've not lost any of the context. And in fact, we're able to be better prepared to make accessible publications because we have more information than, for instance, if someone was just using an HTML workflow and just trying to um, place tags around things, mostly how based on how they look. Um, I'm going to stop and catch my breath for a second. Does anyone have any questions or I mean, I could talk all day, but I want to hear if anyone has anything that, um, that they want to just pit, you know, just jump in with. John, maybe you could talk a little yes. bit about um, what project managers uh, could either ask their authors to do or should look for. Oh, sure. Um, some examples of that. <clears throat> Uh, you know, if speaking to how to make something more accessible from the beginning stages, for instance, <clears throat> some of the good, um, and actually I have some of those outlined here, things like, rather than saying like, see, uh, you know, having numbered and coherent, you know, figures, tables and boxes, things like that, rather than saying like, see my last example, things like that, but rather have having it explicitly done so it may say like see figure 1.1 rather than see f see the figure you know th on the next page or things like that so anything that can be done to eliminate some of um potential confusion with <clears throat> you have to think about even when writing the book how someone could interpret it if they can't see what's being done on a on a printed page for example so <clears throat> and some of the ways to do that are avoiding directional language, um, avoid using images with really dense text, because the goal is <clears throat> if that image goes away, so to speak, could, a, could an individual still understand the intention of what the book is trying to describe? Um, in part, that can be, uh, there's something called alternate text, which um, can help mitigate some of those issues, but alternate text, and we, our system accommodates that. Um, it can be tricky, and I'm, I'm no expert in writing alternate text, but I'm, it can be tricky to describe something that, um, for instance, an image that is just filled with, with all kinds of text. So I would encourage people, you know, try to keep, um, try to keep the descriptions um, concise and, and also have captions that adequately describe um, an image rather than just um, placing an image there where, where, where you have to rely on reading the, the, in, you know, the inside of the image and any text it may contain to understand it. So even if a book doesn't have alternate text, um, you basically get credit, so to speak, um, for accessibility by just merely having captions that adequately describe uh, the images. Um, um, let's see. The other thing I would say, and um, tables I know are necessary. Um, I would caution people to only use tables when absolutely necessary to show tabular information. 
Um, if something can be a hierarchical list, that's much more preferred. Um, and I, you know, yeah, I think it's more accessible in the, in the long run, not to mention a tables and eBooks are kind of clunky. And by the time you get past three or four columns, they're not going to work well anyway. Um, you know, obviously people still make tables. I encounter them every day. So, but that's something, um, you know, something useful to put, to put out there. Um, and this could definitely come, uh, things like colors, which could definitely come into play in textbooks for sure. Um, you know, try to think about if, if some, if you're using color to explain something, try to think of at least an alternate way or, or you know, an additional way of describing it, or maybe an alt, an alternative way of describing it. So it, um, not only for people with differing abilities, people with differing devices can't see that color necessarily. So I would caution um, folks to, to avoid doing things like that. Um, what else? Having a, yeah, and having a comprehensive table of contents um, that contains all of the appropriate head levels, you know, lists of illustrations and tables if appropriate. Um, to basically harness every bit of uh, navigation and hyperlinking possible in an ebook um, to really you know, ease and use of the book and so that people can get from spot to spot. Um, uh, let's see, what else? John, would yeah, you- go ahead, sure. Would you be willing to uh, share the link to this document and I could add it to the accessibility module? Oh, absolutely. Great. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do that. So I've worked on this a little. We're all, I'm also in the process of um, above this, which I have hidden from you, which because it's still in progress, kind of like a, a quick start guide to XML in general um, with just kind of just plain language and ways to explain what XML is, what it does, what it doesn't do, you know, why, why we use it, why it's so important to us and, um, and what its strengths are and, you know, just things like that. So, and as that comes out, I'm, you know, that will definitely be shared with you as well. So I'm, I'm happy to, happy to share this. And I realize that this is, a, especially when just kind of breezing through a demo, it's a lot to get into the code and everything. Um, mm -hmm. But just to reiterate um, what my colleague said, you know, I, I'm happy to talk about this with any individual who's going to try to uh, look under the hood of, of EPUBs more, you know, um, I enjoy doing that and you know, I welcome any questions about that. Um, so I don't want to go too. Yeah. With this. <laughs> well, thank you. We really appreciate your expertise and your time visiting us. And I know that um, we're all committed to providing accessible textbooks. So having your support and documentation is really helpful. Um, there's one note in my notes about PDFs from InDesign. Um, Elvis or Mike, can you help me think what that may, what we may have wanted John to cover there as we transition into a conversation about printing, perhaps? Um, my, well, that, you may be referring to web PDFs. Um, yeah, I think that, that might be it, John. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, which, do you want me to do you want me to say something about web PDFs? Please, yes, thank oh, you. Oh, sure. Um, so, more and more, I mostly I think based on ebook distributors, we're we're getting a lot. We get requests for web PDFs, which is essentially, um, it's it's a static PDF that you know, unlike a reflowable ebook, it's technically an ebook format, but it's a, a PDF in which you know, it basically has some bookmarks along the side, a cover has been added, and it has a linked table of contents. Um, generally, the, what's been acceptable in the easiest way is we have some procedures to go from an, an InDesign file that's already in our system and generate these hyperlinks and bookmarks um, rather quickly and then output a PDF that's suitable for, and we optimize it and it's suitable for distribution in addition to an EPUB. Um, there is something called an accessible PDF, which is significantly more work and is still something that we're considering under development, but 
we're not currently doing that. Um, we haven't really gotten any requests for that either. Um, but we have, we do have a procedure that um, works really well. If, if an individual, once a, a book is solidified and everything's ready to go, um, that procedure for creating a web PDF is pretty easy to follow. And it typically takes uh, between 20, you know, kind of 15 to 20 minutes or something like that um, to basically get a distributable web PDF that has um, a, a cover inserted in it and means for navigation. Mm -hmm. That's all that, that uh, the web PDF is basically. And I want to just quickly add, um, just because it, it, it goes into what we were talking about now with the web PDF, uh, when we were working on um, inferring and explaining uh, Karen Bjork's um, project, when we first generated the PDF, um, Adobe um, um, Acrobat Reader or just Acrobat, I think they, it currently has an option that it tries to like auto generate links, but it doesn't really work. Um, it sort of generates broken links. Um, and so when we sent the first PDF, which was a print PDF, um, the author was like, hey, all my links are broken. Why aren't they working? And so then we had to go in and explain, no, once we get to the ebook stage, we will generate a web PDF that has all our links, all the links um, available, and it'll have the table of contents, as John has said, um, links so that it could, um, you know, you can go to specific uh, sections. Um, and I believe, uh, Emily, she just linked to um, the flipping book version of this, and I believe, yeah, the, the web PDF version was, was what was used uh, to create this. So. What you see is, is that, that difference between web PDF, which is a PDF that has all the links available, and it's a little bit more accessible than just a standard PDF. A standard PDF won't have all those links, and even though Acrobat will try to do it automatically, it does not do a good job yet. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to point that out and, and just point out that that difference occurs, and you may want to talk about the, uh, to the authors as you're planning uh, your book about that, that they're going to get a, a a print PDF, one that's easily printable by any printer or any print-on-demand service, um, but also they will be getting a web PDF um, if that's a service that you guys choose uh, to use for your books. So are there any questions for John about accessibility or about EPUBs that you guys have? <laughs> like I said, if no one has questions now, I'm. <clears throat> I'm always available and, you know, enjoy answering questions. So um, I'm happy to follow up with anyone individually or whatever makes sense. Thanks, John. No problem. Okay. I think we're going to transition into talking about print. Um, so show of hands, how many of you think that you may plan on providing print copies of the open textbooks you make in the co -op? Three hands, and a, and a maybe hand, <laughs> and invisible hands. Okay, <laughs> there's a visible hand. Okay, so it seems like maybe more than half, um, and there can be some fun surprises when trying to um, provide print copies. And so Mike is going to talk about that in the big picture. And then I'll just share a couple nuggets that I've learned from the community, sharing their experiences, trying to provide, for example, print on demand. Um, I've learned that, for example, uh, Lulu will not allow an ISBN if you're going to charge zero dollars for a book. Um, you know, fun things like that, because it, it, it makes sense. These print-on-demand services are not set up for, you know, open educational resources. Um, so as you guys start um, thinking about how you might want to provide print copies, which could be through your bookstore, it could be how you already do it for, um, you know, books that have been adopted by faculty on your campus. Um, turn to us and we can um, share what we know. And then I also think this would be a really good office hours topic. So um, I'm working on that. Without further ado, I will turn it over to the expert, Michael Miller. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> so um, 
starting at the general and moving into more specific, uh, there's two primary uh, technologies used for printing these days. There's offset printing and there's digital printing. Um, offset printing uh, uses printing presses, uh, has been around in one form or, or another for over a century. Uh, when you think about someone running in and yelling, stop the presses, that's what they're talking about. That's offset printing. Um, it, it actually uses ink uh, and huge rolls of paper that are run through the printing press, cut up and, and, and bound. Uh, digital printing uh, doesn't use ink, it uses toner, uh, uses uh, uh, digital uh, printing devices. They're much more in common with your laser jet printer or your inkjet printer that you might have on your desk. Um, the, uh, the rule of thumb uh, between them is um, offset printing can produce lots and lots of copies cheaply. Uh, however, in order to get those massive presses uh, set up to work on your project, uh, there's significant setup charges. Uh, whereas on a per cost, ba per item basis, digital printing might be more, a little more expensive, but you don't have to set it up. You can just sort of push a button and go. So uh, the rule of thumb I've always heard bandied about is a thousand copies, that if you're going to be producing more than a thousand copies, you wanna start looking at offset printing. Uh, if you're gonna be producing uh, fewer than a thousand copies, uh, it's not gonna make economic sense to look into offset printing. Uh, Cause yeah, for a lot of these places, a thousand copies is almost a rounding error uh, when they're doing offset uh, printing. And so if you're doing fewer than that, uh, the price just isn't, isn't affordable. Uh, so if we're looking in the realm of digital printing, fewer than a thousand copies, uh, the two different things you need to think about is uh, what is called short run digital printing. That is, oh, we want to make 500 books. We want to make, you know, 250 books. Uh, we even want to make a hundred books at a time uh, versus uh, what some people might call true print on demand. Uh, and that's when they make one book at a time. There are some economies of scale that come into um, even on the digital printing end. So you'll probably pay uh, less per copy if you run out a few hundred copies than if you get it set up to do one copy at a time that they only print a copy when someone orders it. Uh, but the difference is not as extreme. Um, online sites like uh, Karen had mentioned Lulu. Lulu set up to do, uh, can do true print on demand. You can order just one copy. Um, I, I made a book for my own personal use last week and I ordered one copy. <laughs> uh, it arrived in the mail. Uh, it was like t uh, $10 per copy plus shipping. Uh, if I had ordered 200 copies, the price would have probably dropped to six or seven dollars per copy. Um, the next thing to think to be aware of when you're thinking about printing is the difference between color printing versus black and white printing. Um, in the digital printing, there, there's always going to be a cost difference, and color printing is always going to be more expensive than black and white printing. However, uh, in the digital world, that's sort of fewer than a thousand copies, um, the price difference is not quite as extreme. Uh, if you're trying to do color printing uh, in uh, an offset printing type environment, those thousand or more copies, uh, that can be very, very expensive. Because it has to run through the, if you think about it, it has to run through the printing press four times. Um, to get the cyan, the magenta, the yellow, and the black ink down. Uh, 
so some best practices to for when you're dealing with printers uh, my first uh, suggestion is always get multiple quotes from multiple sources um, because the variation in uh, quotes that you're going to get for printing will probably surprise you. Uh, I always suggest that people be a little suspicious if there's an outlier that's very, very low, which uh, brings me to my next point. Always ask for samples of work from any print shop that you are going to deal with. Um, because Mike, can I, sorry yes. to interrupt. Please. Uh, I would just like to add a quick example of the multiple quotes or the wonky pricing that can sometimes happen when working on print projects. So at OTNSI last year, we offered Summer Institute attendees the authoring guide, which had a full bleed cover, hot pink. Um, it was about 48 pages. I don't remember if I chose matte or glossy. But I was trying to remember, you know, how much did we spend on that? And I was going through my emails and I kept coming across a thousand dollars. And I was like, a thousand dollars, that doesn't seem right for 25 copies. And it was through an online printer called Overnight Press. And finally, Sarah helped dig up the actual invoice and it was like a thousand dollars with a discount of $834. You know, so the actual job was like $134, but um, there's just kind of weird stuff happening when it comes to printing or printing online. And so you really have to dig to find out like, what is the actual cost of printing this thing with these different variables? Like that full um, cover bleed is a, is a little bit of a uh, glamorous um, thing to include. Like uh, for example, what's the, what's the foil, Michael? It's not going to happen in textbooks, but <laughs> no. it's a beautiful, expensive thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. You can get uh, foil embossed covers and things like that, um, as uh, you'll sometimes see on wedding invitations or the like. Which reminds me, um, looking for printers online is definitely a good thing to do. But also, don't neglect your local Yellow Pages because there are print shops all over the place because people need wedding invitations and things printed. And some of these places will also do books. Some of them won't. Some of them will do books and they don't do books well or they'll price it too much. But if you're, uh, if they're close enough that you can save on shipping, that might end up making the difference in cost, making up the difference if they charge a little bit more for printing, but you can just drive down the street and pick up your books. And also the fact that you will have better face-to-face -face communication is also something you should uh, uh, take into account. Um, but yes, uh, always ask for samples from any print shop that you work with. Uh, if they're reluctant to send you samples, that's a red, red flag. Um, most printers will have their um, the PDF settings that they want you to use when you create the PDF available on their website. Um, or at the very least, they should have someone technical that can tell you how they want their PDF prepared for them. Uh, there are some PDF formats that are pretty universally acceptable, but you it's also somewhat of a test of the printer's technical knowledge that they can tell you, oh, well, we use these, except these universal formats. Um, so they should be able to tell you that information of how they want uh, their PDFs prepared. Another rule of thumb, very, very important. Always, if you're, if you yeah, always review a proof before you approve that this is okay to go to final print. Always, always, always. Uh, even if you're setting it up for print, true print on demand that, that uh, the students or whoever is going to uh, uh, just order their books one by one and those they're not going to print them until the books are ordered. Uh, still review a proof before you give the authorization for that file to be printed because you want to make sure that 
your print PDF file interacted with their printing technology correctly, that everything looks correct, uh, study it closely. If there's a major error that you find and you discuss with your uh, printer how to fix it, review another proof before you give that final approval. Uh, you know, particularly if you're having a run of 500 books, you don't want to risk there being a major error in there and then you have to mulch 500 books. Uh, I've been in that position and it's not fun. Um, we didn't go too deeply into uh, typesetting in this orientation. Um, just like we didn't go too deeply into ebooks. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, Adobe InDesign is the industry standard uh, software for typesetting. It is not the only software that, uh, um, that you can use for typesetting. Uh, I've mentioned before, uh, with perhaps a hint of derision in my voice, you can typeset a book in Microsoft Word. I don't recommend it, but you can do it uh, if that's the only thing you have. If your uh, institution has access to Quark Express, Quark Express is another typesetting uh, um, program. Uh, I've used Quark Express for years. I don't use it anymore. Uh, uh, Scribe, we use InDesign for all of our typesetting work. Uh, there is also a program out there. Yes, Quark is still around. Um, Yes, they keep sending me emails telling me why I should upgrade. <laughs> um, Quark is still around. There is an open source typesetting program called Scribus that I know nothing about other than what I've already said. It's an open source typesetting program um, that is open source, free to use. Uh, it's called Scribus. I don't know how well it works, but if uh, your uh, publishing program is on a budget. It's an option to explore. Uh, and I think that's, does anyone have any questions about print? Um, wonderful. I just had a, yeah. this past week actually, I sent a book off to be printed and if you can see this, it's a collection of essays for uh, one of our scholars here. And so I, I did it at um, at the Ingram Spark, and I thought yes. that I thought that it went really pretty well. This was I ordered one copy to as a sample to see how it turned out. It, it did turn out that they sort of cut off the the margin there on top. Mm. You can see that, so it's it kind of looks like it got cut a little bit short. So I'm glad I only ordered one. <laughs> and it was I think thirteen dollars or something for one sample. So. So I, I fixed that and I sent it back in and I submitted an order yesterday. So, but I thought it it, it was pretty smooth and and uh, for for the needs that uh, that we're doing, you can kind of see that LXX means seventy and he and our our scholars turning seventy mm -hmm. and we I ordered seventy copies. So um, <laughs> it's it, it worked pretty well, but and I, I produced the. The text in a in a press books, uh, so that's kind of where I did that from. But, but yeah, but I, I had a good experience with Ingram Spark so far, and they kind of said that that was an error that uh, margin getting cut off was beyond their margin of error, so they would have replaced it and stuff. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ingram Spark uh, does a, a good um, short run and print on demand uh, lightning source. Uh, is sort of a, a, a major name in, in that area. Um, I don't know how it works with open textbooks, but I know that Amazon's CreateSpace also does um, printing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Lulu, like uh, uh, Karen had mentioned, those are the places I would go first if I were looking somewhere online. Yeah, it's great to hear your experience, Greg. Thank you for sharing that. I was talking to Ingram Spark for a while to explore whether we could work with them as a cooperative. And the snag that I ran into was ISBN's, wait, no, no, I think I'm, 
there, there was an ISBN snag in that if the OTN provided ISBN numbers to cooperative members, we would appear as the publisher of record. So we did not continue to pursue providing ISBNs, but um, if that's a need, let me know. Um, and I'm, it's been too long now for me to recall the exact details, but I think there was that was related to why it was hard to scale up with Ingram Spark as a cooperative. Um, but if there is, you know, wide interest in the co-op for providing print copies and, it, and you're having trouble doing that locally, you know, please keep me abreast of your, of your troubles um, or your thoughts or ideas on how maybe we could keep exploring that as a community. Okay, home stretch here. I would now like to pause. I don't know um, how many of you had this experience when you were in college, but I remember at the end of the quarter having the um, evaluation Scantron passed around in class to evaluate the course and instructor right then and there. Um, and then, you know, through the years, that's transitioned to here's a link to a survey. Uh, which has greatly reduced the amount of feedback received. So I'm going to try and do a hybrid old school um, digital survey and ask us to just take a few minutes while we're here in class. Um, and if you could share your feedback about the orientation uh, in this form at, um, at the link in the chat that I just put, that would be greatly appreciated. Any feedback is welcome. It is anonymous. I'm not asking for your emails. So I will not know um, what you have shared. So um, I'm just going to pause. I'm going to stop recording for a few minutes um, and ask that you guys just take a few moments to reflect. We really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to offer us suggestions and share more about your experience. As you know, this is our second time um doing the cooperative orientation meetings and uh elvis and i who were there for the first time feel that this time has benefited from the feedback we got the first time and so uh, we know that uh, your colleagues who will come after you will benefit from um, your feedback as well so thank you um, we're now going to talk about archiving best practice practices and packaging files and i think that is also with michael Right. Um, so we, um, uh, Elvis talked earlier about the importance of using a, a robust format for archiving your projects. And that goes in hand in hand with actually archiving the files. Um, the three most important rules um, for archiving files is always back up, always back up, always back up. Um, the target we aim for here at Scribe uh, is actually um, what uh, work as though every night when you shut down your computer, it will not be there in the morning and that you can continue working regardless. Uh, so everything should be backed up off site uh, at the end of every working day is the, the ideal, but particularly when you reach the end of a project and you, you finished you're done, you have a book. Um, yes, it's time to pop the champagne, but it's also time to uh, make sure that you have everything you will need uh, in the future if you're ever going to go back to this book to produce a new edition or for whatever reason, um, to take chapters out of it to use for a new book, whatever. You wanna make sure that you have everything you need. Um, so let me paste my notes here into the chat because it's probably going to be easier to see visually. Um, if you've been working in print, you're going to want the fonts, uh, like Myra mentioned. You're going to want uh, whatever art or images that you used. Uh, you're going to want the mechanicals, the InDesign files that you used for typesetting. Uh, because and you're going to want the PDF that you sent to the printer. Uh, because like we said, that PDF is great for if you wanna just, oh, we need to print out another 100 books, no changes, send it over and it's no problem. 
but if you do need to make changes, that PDF isn't going to help you. You're going to need those mechanical files, uh, those InDesign files. Uh, if you're working in eBooks, <clears throat> you're going to want your EPUB. Uh, if you have a Mobi, which is a Kindle edition, you'll want that. If you have a web PDF, you'll want that. Uh, and you'll want your SCML file, which is the heart of it all, that you could essentially use that to recreate any version of the book uh, for any format. Uh, and you'll also want to keep track of documentation, uh, such as your CC BY attributions, your locations of where you got that, because somewhere down the line, someone may need to know uh, yes, the copyright page says that all the images are uh, CC BY, but can we ensure that? Or do we have to go on a search for another, uh, for the images all over again? And <clears throat> ideally, you're going to archive all these files in more than one location, uh, whether that's uh, up in the cloud in a service like Google Drive or Dropbox or uh, whatever your institution has available and also potentially in a physical medium uh, like an external hard drive or a CD or what have you. So, uh, and most of you work in library science, so I don't have to say, make sure you label and keep your backups organized so that you can find them again because uh, information that you can't find is useless information. So yeah, that's um, all I wanted to say on archiving. If there are any questions. I have a question. Yeah. So um, thinking about how the SCML file is the master file, the one that if you were going to um, like modify or update, that's, that's what you would be working with. I was wondering if there's um, any type of recommendation or best practice for we publish an open textbook, we put it on you know, a repository, our website, but making sure people know um, this textbook is licensed CC BY, so it can be modified, um, but we have this file. Um, like keep in mind there is this file that we can share with you if you were to want to modify it. Um, and is there any recommendation you have for making sure people know or sharing that file? Um, Emily, I would suggest adding language much like you just uh, said, not just to where the files are downloadable, but also potentially in the front matter with the license material. And that way anyone who's interested in remixing it will see right there, oh, okay, I can reach out to this person and get like whatever file type they may want, probably um, as you mentioned, sort of the master file, but maybe they want to work in Word instead, and you can choose to make that available also. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that, that um, SCML is not like closed or anything. It's not like, oh, hey, you know, you're working in SCML, so you're stuck. It, it is based on XML, um, so, um, and everything's available on our site, and so if you, you know, want to just share the SCML file, you're free to do that as well because the content after all is open and SCML itself is open. So, you know, you have that option as well. So you can like put that up. Um, I know for inferring and explaining, you have like the, the PDF, you have the EPUB and you have the Mobi. Um, you can possibly even include an option and say, here's the SCML file um, that there's no proprietary software that's needed for that or anything. It's just XML. So it's, you can make that available as well. And others would understand the SCML markup without going through Scribe. Um, I believe that they can, <laughs> as long as they look at the documentation, because there is some like like little things that we put that, but our uh, documentation is also open, so it's not like it's behind like a sign-in wall or anything like that. So if somebody grabs that and they're like, "Oh, what's this SCML file?" and they search for SCML, they're going to hit right our they're going to hit right okay. at our website and have all that information available to them. The SCML list, I think it is, is actually uh, just freely open and available and everything. So, Yes, I, I just put that link in the chat and anyone in the world can look at that without any permissions or anything. So, mm -hmm. And it's still based in Word, so anyone familiar with Word yeah. can. Or XML. Yeah, they'll, 
it's it's a tagging system that if even if you have like experience with even in HTML, HTML is also well formed, so it has the tag system. So there's there's a one to one correspondence there, and again, the documentation is available, so it is open in that sense. Amira, to your question, it will probably depend on what the um, remixing author has in mind, like what kind of final file types or product that person may want to offer. If they're not concerned about offering a, you know, a, a designed print copy or if, you know, there's sort of this range of different possible outputs that somebody could be interested in doing, I think that will inform which file type they select to work from. Yeah, I'm just worried about sort of this whole longevity thing where, you know, my institutional repository is based on PDFs. Well, how long have PDFs been around? You know, not that long. And, you know, one of my professors who did revise a book, it was from the 90s, you know, so whatever file they had, if they had anything from the 90s, I mean, they might have had to retype the whole or scan and, you know, cap whatever. So I just, right now we're just talking about short term, you know, how long is Scribe around for? You know, we saw with B Press that they're not around for that long. <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 it's a kind of a weird world in which to try to talk about archiving for any kind of longevity. Mm -hmm. Just to, just to add, to, add to that, because um, I'm, I'm the archivist here, so I guess I have some input. But uh, uh, the, when we were talking about archiving, you guys are using that word in a very different way from the way I, I would use it because uh, to archive a PDF file uh, would probably be the way to go in a PDF A standard or format. But the, but the point of it is never to change it, right? The point of it is that I'm, I'm not trying to sort of mine that data out of it. Uh, I'm trying to retain it as in its original format and place as possible that that look in context so so the function of uh, for me to to save pdfs is very different than me wanting to ever go back to actually to remix the content of it it's actually just to retain the look and feel and all and everything that can be original about it so um and pdf a different pdf a standards or formats are 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 the best thing right now for that type of thing. But, um, but yeah, it's just a, a difference in, in purpose, obviously, uh, uh, for between, between uh, uh, publishing versus uh, 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 retaining information indefinitely, like, a archi like an archive. Right. And I think PDF, as you said, for just holding that information, just having it, in, just having it available um, is, is just fine. Uh, but when you think of, remixing or restoring or, or like, you know, doing reprints or anything like that, then PDF sort of, um, I think so, some of it's luster in that point. Um, I was going to mention something that I've, I've forgotten now, um, but, oh, um, how Myra just mentioned what, well, you know, Scribe may not be around like, you know, 20 years from now uh, and whatnot. But the good thing is, is that when you work in the workflow, and again, this is not a sales pitch, it's just, I guess, uh, a fact of it. When you work in the workflow and you have, for example, the Word file, the SCML file, the PDF, the EPUB, the Mobi, and you have all that available to you, then you know that your data, whether we're around or not, is still available. And since SCML is based on XML, which is, you know, something that is, the content will never be lost unless we lose all data, you know, in the apocalypse or something. And at that point, I think we have other things to worry about. So um, I think that the idea is is not so much like uh, a dependence on Scribe. We do not want to like sort of like pitch it that way, uh, but rather um, a, and the idea is to like make sure that your content is available and you can do something with it whenever you want to do something with it. And if in the end it's like, oh, if this was a one-off, this will never be reprinted again and it's just there, well, then you still have all the information just in case. Right. And uh, <clears throat> also as far as Scribe not being around, uh, I just put the SCML list on the Internet Archive on the Wayback Machine just now. So it's in there. <laughs> You know, as long as the as long as the Wayback Machine is around, um, SCML will be around. 
And these are definitely all of your files. You know, they're not Scribe's files. They don't belong to Scribe. Scribe doesn't keep them. Um, but I, I absolutely understand these concerns. And I appreciate the different input, like the archival perspective. Are there other questions related to this or concerns? Okay. Related, um, one of the things that we're working on as a cooperative are maintenance plans. You may have been able to attend the office hours session we had, I think, two months ago on creating a maintenance plan. And really the idea for this is to ensure that we don't publish books that then sort of just languish and die a slow death and aren't checked in on periodically to make sure that they're still alive and well and the links are working and all those things. So um, that's in progress. I'm trying to put something together and then I'll share it with you to get your feedback so that we can come to some kind of best practice or guidelines for maintaining the open textbooks that we create in the cooperative. Um, I think that's it. And so as our closing activity, uh, it would be great to hear from all of you. Um, one thing that you've learned from our time together, a key takeaway, it, it can be technical or not. And if during this time that we've been meeting, there have been any changes or movement on open textbook projects that um, you know are coming, you can share with us kind of where you're at um, in, in whatever stage. So I'm going to try not calling on somebody. Uh, maybe there'll be a volunteer and then we can just uh, go around and, and say, our, say our farewells. Emily? I can do it, but can I also start with a question? Maybe this will be for people to brainstorm. So I'm wondering if um, this is probably a really basic question, but if someone could just explain, uh, like the if Pressbooks and SCML and Scribe would could work together, and what that would look like, or are they kind of like um, competing platforms? Just sort of a walkthrough of Pressbooks and Scribe SCML. Sure. Do you want to start, Elvis? Sure. Uh, so I don't think we're competing with Pressbooks in, in, in that sense, um, just because our, our workflow is sort of just a way, not, a, not just to publish, but a way to sort of create the, the, the textbooks. I don't know Pressbooks uh, gives you that option, but um, as we've mentioned before, like our design capabilities, we actually use designers like, you know, Mike. Um, and um, there, are, there are other things that we do. And I don't think that we're mutually exclusive. So for example, if you compose uh, a word file, this is something that we're sort of still working out. Um, but if you compose a word file or you edit it through us or anything like that, um, there shouldn't be anything that stops you from then just taking that word file and, you know, putting it up on Pressbooks and, and doing that. Um, unless there's something in the cooperative that I'm not remembering now, Karen. So, okay, good. So you are free to sort of do with that as you, as you wish. And again, like Scribe, we offer you that flexibility and say, you just want us to edit it because you want our expertise or you just want us to proofread. Um, you, we can do that and that's, and that's fine. So, um, I think you can think of us as if if you're going to go down the route of, you know, press books, you can think of our services as supplemental to uh, what you're going to do. So I don't think that we're in, in like head to head and say like, oh, you got to use Scribe or use pre press books. It's like you can use both, um, whichever works for your institution. Um, and Karen, I hope I didn't speak out of turn or anything, but I think that's that's where we're at. Um, yeah, yeah. So in the in the sort of grand scheme of things, in the OTN, our goal is to offer different publishing pathways for different members because we have such different member types. Um, those of you on the call, some of you are at a private institution, some of you are at a R1, some of you are you know associated with a consortium, um, and so a lot of times there are different publishing goals. Um, as you heard from Karen Bjork, she already had a publishing program and she wanted to be able to offer more services and um, sort of elevate the program. So for her, the cooperative was a good fit for that. But absolutely, I think I can imagine um, people even choosing different uh, publishing pathways depending on the project, depending on what the faculty author has in mind, what that person thinks would work best for their students, what kind of experience they want their students to have. And so um, 
by all means, if there's a way for these pathways to complement each other, that's great. I think it would be really fun to see how people sort of mix and match um, depending on what their needs are. I think some confusion perhaps comes from sort of this pathways metaphor that I've been using. It sounds like all of these pathways diverging in the wood, ne'er shall they meet again. Um, and so, you know, this is definitely an evolving program and there's um, a lot to think about and still figure out about supporting publishing. Um, but with the cooperative, as Elvis mentioned, uh, I saw a big benefit in sort of that one-stop professional shop and like, oh, look, we can turn to these real people who have years of experience in these different um, publishing areas like typesetting, like copy editing. Um, so for people who want different eyes and different inputs onto a textbook project in a particular workflow, this is one way to do it. Um, and then Pressbooks, as you know, is also a great tool for publishing. Um, Greg just showed us an example. Um, their PDFs are standardized. I think as Jeremy talked about in the last meeting or two meetings, there are different themes. So you don't have the same flexibility in the output in terms of how it may look, but it's closer to sort of that one button publishing experience that we're accustomed to online. So two different things, but by all means, um, they can be friends. Does that help? That helps so much. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll, I can answer the questions too. So I think um, one key takeaway for me in all this is that, uh, you know, someone who like myself, who really has no experience in um, publishing, that there is an approach with not too high of a barrier entry to entry for me to do that composition piece that was really eye opening um, and exciting. I think I'll need a lot more practice and um, but it was still exciting to see that that even exists. And then I don't, for question two, I don't have any um, changes or movement on projects at this point, but I'll definitely keep you all up to date as things evolve. Great. And listening to Emily reminds me that another um, potential flexibility within the cooperative too is if you do have you know, the budget or funding or sort of larger scale program where you can sort of hand things over to somebody and then have them come back um, polished and uh, quality checked, that that is something that could work for, for some programs. Thanks for getting us started, Emily. I guess I could go next. Super. Can, you hear, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. You probably just saw me talking into my muted microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm grateful for, I'm, I am grateful for the opportunity uh, to learn from all of you, all, all, all you experts. And um, um, I'm also really looking forward to having a, a network um, to whom I can turn to uh, for my questions because I, I have a bazillion questions flying around. Um, uh, the, um, in terms of, um, it was, it really was a good overview as, as far as the take, takeaway is concerned, a tremendous overview, um, of everything that's involved. So it was a really great flyover for me. It was like a good 30,000 foot look, and that was very useful. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to balance everything out, but, um, that's, that's why I'm grateful to have you folks to turn to later. Um, in terms of um, the status um, of my uh, book project, um, we have, we have a, my, the, my author has basically has an 18 page detailed outline that she's completed and now we're um, diving into one chapter and we're going to be looking at openers and closers and um, you know, um, pedagogical devices and things like that to see if we can start on a standard. Uh, so um, we're having that meeting today at one, so I'm looking forward to it. She's, and she's very excited, so uh, hopefully it'll all go well. Yeah, keep us posted. Okay. Thank you, Sunny. Okay, I'm gonna start calling on people because we're getting tight on time, so I'm just gonna go as I see you on my screen. Greg, would you mind going next? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, definitely uh, was good to kind of 
see it all put together um, with the, the book that I had showed that I was working on with Pressbooks, um, kind of, uh, which was a project that, that came independently of, of, uh, of, of the textbook pu publishing stuff, but that cropped up at the same time around here. And so uh, just to kind of see the, an overview of how it gets put together, how uh, a professional service like Scribe and production actually does it um, really does really did give me a lot of insight into what I'm looking for uh, when I am trying to do something either in press books or looking for even to print something or then how it's all going to come together so we have all these different systems whether it's you know press books or scribe services or uh, uh, B press to put them on or whatever however you're gonna configure this thing uh, it was just a good I way to kind of see the components laid out for me uh, helps helps me uh, kind of give me more of a vision for how it would look in our scale. Great. And is there any um, update on, uh, I think you guys had identified one textbook project. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to hopefully meet with the author here at the end of the um, semester. Uh, it's kind of a, a a little bit non-traditional because he he's already written it so it's he's had this textbook that is basically uh from years and years of teaching the same ethics class and so we're it's a he's got a a manuscript but kind of we're going to look at it with him to see how we can sort of pivot it into the textbook arena with all those sort of textbook elements and things like that so so yeah we're excited to kind of look look at it with him um he's got some other projects that he's working on but uh, he did uh, tell us that he'd, that he'd commit some time to this, so yeah. Great, thank you. Myra? Um, yeah, this, this has been a pretty uh, intense. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to it than I ever thought, which is a little scary, because then I have to figure out you know, how much of a team we need to pull together. Uh, but I am having conversations with my um, my chair about uh, who else I might be able to involve in publishing services because this can't be this I see this can't be done by one person um, and so I've kind of not contacted my authors because you know until I have the clearer picture of where I need to have the conversation but we were also working a lot on our OER initiative to begin with and and it's, it's finally getting, I talked to the provost today, bumped into some, you know, where she was going, yes, yes, we'll really be behind you in the fall on this. And, um, and we had the student association who's, who meets with the president every month. And so now the president's sending emails and going, what's going on with OER? <laughs> so, so I think we're, you know, that's where I'm kind of focusing my energies right now is, 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 is getting that, but I will contact the two people. Um, and I have a general question about, I saw the scribe services, you know, cost sheet, but you know, how much does it cost to just keep asking you guys questions? Cause I know that once I start, <laughs> it's not going to be specifically necessarily about composing or this or that, but it'll be a little bit of everything, you know? So. It's a great question, Myra, and one we're still figuring out. Um, but that's one reason why the Google group is a great place to start because um, everyone can learn from that question there and it's possible that someone other than Elvis or Mike may be able to answer the question as well. Elvis or Mike, I don't know if you want to add any information there. Um, I guess I'll start and then uh, I'll give it to Mike. Um, we are more than happy to, to answer questions like, um, like John said, like we, what we do here, it's, you know, I guess a passion if you think about it. So, um, yeah, send the questions to the Google group and we will answer. Um, there will be some sometimes where, like, for example, Michael and myself will be uh, so swamped with work that we might get to you like a week later. Um, but um, we will, you know, always strive to, like, you know, I, I don't want to say handhold because that's a bad bad term but but not leave you out there like drowning by yourself uh, we are you know partners in this so uh, yeah that's essentially what I want to say I don't know if Michael wants to add anything to that well and just um, both Elvis and I and Karen should be in the tea times the first Monday of every month for questions as they come up mm-hmm 
And Myra, I mean, if you start getting like knee deep into project consultations and things like that, then, um, you know, Scribe can create an estimate for you on like what may be involved. Okay. Um, super speedy, because I know you guys have other places to go. Adam? Um, I'm mostly excited to um, help faculty at the early stages in planning, um, just doing the instructional design thought into structure and elements that make a book or book-like objects that aren't really books ultimately into uh, useful experiences for students. I'm excited how our school is expanding beyond the expectation that each course has a book. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to parse that out and move those same principles into just course design. Great. So it's a, a little tangential, but. Yeah, well, we're excited to have uh, you and instructional designers and archivists join us in the cooperative so that you can share what you learn in those conversations. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah, I think it's going to help us focus or defocus uh, our, our program to some extent. It, you know, helped me understand what is possible, what is impossible. And then I think now will be our time to internally say, what do we want to do? What do we not want to do? If we don't want to do this, what do we need to do differently? You know, so I have a much clearer idea of what the co-op is and isn't now. You know, I kind of had a vague idea, but my some of my early uh, perceptions were wrong. So now I have a much better idea. So I'm, I'm I feel confident going forward, knowing what support systems exist or don't exist. Great. And Marilyn, are you there? And yep, I'm right oh. here. And uh, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. I started talking. Um, so I was really taken by the whole approach that uh, this orientation session had. Uh, you know, I've missed two or three sessions here that I've got to catch up on, but I feel much more um, able, I think, to speak now with our press director about um, the, the fact they use Scribe as well as we do and how might we work more closely together. I think our, our dean is looking to see how we might work together. They report to a different part of the university structure, of course, than, than we do. But there's some significant potential there, uh, I think. And we've had a lot of interest from faculty members over the past few years with our open ed program. And I mean, Jeremy could speak more directly to that at the moment since I'm on sabbatical, but I, I see a lot of uh, potential here for, for future growth. Well, great. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us in this orientation and sharing your feedback. And we look forward to continuing to support you and let us know if there's something that you need that you don't think is here or um, if you have ideas for other pathways. And so until we meet again, perhaps on Monday at tea time or in the Google group or elsewhere, uh, best wishes. Farewell. Bye. Thank Bye. you.